Tail Foundry released a brand new video and this seems to talk about the most terrifying manga he has ever read or something like that. Of course I'm always open to new uh, varieties of horror and I mean I have read almost every manga by Junji Ito even his uh, adaptation of No Longer Human maybe this is not about uh, our friend Junji Ito this is about an entirely different manga author either way I'm fascinated by the way they presented their video okay now let's check out what the most disturbing manga this person has ever read is please continue i don't know if you've noticed but i don't really read a lot of manga or watch a lot of anime there's not really a specific reason for that i don't necessarily dislike it it's just not really on my radar that often aside from the really standout examples like basically anything Junji Ito has ever written. I'll admit, this does mean I end up missing out on some really cool stuff. Okay, yeah, I think he's on the same boat as I uh, I am. He's most likely read just a bunch of Junji Ito comics and... Well, here's the thing, Junji Ito isn't the... isn't almost... I don't even know how to say this. He isn't exactly... Okay, I'm going to say it like this. Not every one of Junji Ito's stories are a hit. But when they hit, they hit real hard. Because, I mean, I always talk about Slug Girl. What a terrifying fate that is. We also get stuff like Uzumaki and the Army of One. Those are also great stories. And now that I think about it... Do I know any more horror manga cast? I think I I can't remember the name of the person who lo who wrote Drifting Classroom. Guns is Guns. I'm not sure about where I should put it, but it is it does have some cool uh, alien designs and stuff like that. And I would consider it a horror. But I am truly fascinated by which author and which story he will, you know, bring up. So recently, I decided to give one specific manga a shot. One that I've heard so many good things about for years at this point. Hideo Yamamoto's Homunculus. It's about a man who undergoes an archaic trepanation procedure, which means that he has a hole drilled into his head. This, of course gives him essentially a sixth sense and allows him to see people's souls in all their surreal glory. Which sounds super cool, right? The kind of thing that's exactly up my alley? This reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, the show called Deadbeat by Comedy Central. It's, it's almost like that too. It's a, a weird Deadbeat <laughs> who can see ghosts and is dealing with his own stuff that's a really fun series uh, at least I remember it being really fun but I did watch it when I was like 12 so maybe it is like a stupid show but hmm, I thought I, I it just reminded me of that except now that I've read it this thing was way more brutal than I was expecting. I guess I thought it would be more like your average Junji Ito story. Extremely gruesome and creepy and nightmare-inducing. But also, you know, it's fun, fantastical, magical realism, but with the guts hanging out. Homunculus was not quite that. It's absolutely beautiful. It's very well written with incredible art. Boy, is this thing dark. Even for me. Okay, he has a nice intro, but I'm going to skip it. Okay, me 
me the internet is honestly i'm confused okay yeah this is not vpn okay yeah i kind of figured that out yeah he's been sponsored by not vpn not vpn helps him to make more amazing videos like this so i guess i'm willing to forgive a uh, um an ad or two let us continue homunculus follows a man named nakashi who has recently become homeless and is living out of his car in a Tokyo city park. When I first met Nakashi, I was immediately endeared toward him. He seems like a nice, good-natured guy. Yeah, his living situation is terrible, but he makes an effort to get to know the homeless folks living in the park with him. It's clear he takes pride in himself and strives to keep up appearances despite everything. He comes off as gentle, patient, and cautiously optimistic, if a little bumbling. This story did a really good job of getting me to care about the protagonist right off the bat. Right away, I just wanted what was best for him. See this guy get back on his feet. Things take a turn for the worse when his precious car, his home at this point, is towed away and he can't afford to get it back. Desperate for cash, he accepts a strange offer from an even stranger individual to undergo a trepanation procedure in exchange for 700,000 yen. For those of you who are for some reason not clued into ancient forms of medical malpractice, a trepanation is when a little hole is drilled Oops. into your skull for reasons that probably seemed logical at the time. Ah, uh, it's like a lobotomy if the lobotomy was performed by someone who doesn't know how to perform a lobotomy. Okay, let's continue. I mean, not saying that lobotomy is um, a worthwhile solution to people being mentally ill lobotomy is basically the answer to all uh, problems back in the day regarding mental health of course in this case nakashi is told that it will allow him to tap into his sixth sense and miraculously it actually works a few days after the trepanation, Nakashi gains the ability to see weird, distorted versions of people when he covers up his right eye and looks at them. He sees the humans around him change shape to reflect their deepest desires, insecurities, or trauma. In a way, it's like Nakashi can see their souls. In the story, this distortion is called a homunculus, and every homunculus is very different. For instance, a short man is shown to have clouds drifting around his face because he wants to be taller. A young woman's pelvis vibrates whenever her boyfriend calls her. One guy on the street is paper thin to show that he has no personality. Another woman's pelvis is locked behind a safe to show that, I don't know, she's sexually hesitant or something. If you notice there's something sort of off about the difference between how Nakashi sees men's homunculi and women's homunculi, so did I. This will come back later. This crosses over from the realm of sheer spectacle to... Well, this is fascinating because I remember that other show about the girl that sees uh, dead people and other worldly spirits. Uh, I can't remember what it was. It was uh, fun, but it kind of got old. Uh, quickly it was fun for like two episodes then it felt repetitive i mean that's just my opinion you know but shall we continue actual story when nakashi is accosted by one of his debtors a yakuza boss whose homunculus is oddly enough a little boy in a robot suit the child just visible inside the helmet is crying and holding his pinky finger against a scythe blade as if he's about to cut it off. Using his new senses, Nakashi manages to figure out that this is a representation of a traumatic incident from this man's childhood, when he accidentally cut off another little boy's pinky while they were reaping grain together. Now, to grapple with that, the man cuts off the pinkies of people who cross him. He may look huge and violent and imposing, and he is, but within that external armor, he's still just a scared little boy. Nakashi helps the Yakuza boss come to terms with this, and the man is so moved 
that he ends up giving up the Yakuza lifestyle entirely, and his homunculus, like an exercised spirit, disappears. Which was awesome. Exactly what I'd been hoping for from this story. An endearingly unlucky protagonist who goes around helping exercise the homunculus of those he encounters, and sometimes it's a little bit violent or freaky. Is there a specific reason why these things are called homunculi? Because, <clears throat> I mean, doesn't that literally mean like an artificial human? Uh, so, are the thoughts of the people... Uh, okay, I guess they are like stands, right? If you, if you aren't a stand user, you can't see them. But if you have a drill... If you have your skull drilled open, you can see stands. A situation like that, right? So, are the homunculi capable of interacting with the person? Or do the person just appear as a homunculi and only to, the, only to our main character? There are so many interesting uh, questions. Well, not exactly interesting questions. I mean, questions in general I have about this story. Maybe I should, perhaps, I will read it sooner than later. But a good thing overall. As long as that's what would continue to happen, this was on track to becoming one of my favorite stories I've read so far this year. Unfortunately, that is not exactly where the story goes. I'm going to go ahead and drop a content warning right here because from this point on, the manga gets kind of gross. And not in a gory way. Gore, I can handle. The rest of this video, I'll be touching on topics like sexual assault, including that of a minor, stalking, self-harm, and suicide. So if you prefer to tap out of this video now, by all means, take care of yourself. And... Okay, so this is going to be a heavy part of the video, isn't it? Uh, okay, you have been warned. Disclaimers for all that stuff. Now we are moving on. Probably don't read this one. As for the rest of you, you've had your warning. Hold on, because this is where things get really dark. The next homunculus that Nakashi decides to exercise, I guess belongs to Yukari, a 17-year-old high school junior. If you got a sinking feeling from hearing that, just wait, it gets worse. Yukari has a part-time job as a namesara, which is a business where men apparently can go and look at underage girls through one-way glass, watch them do various lewd poses, and then buy their underwear off them. Gross. I really think I could have gone my whole life without seeing this precise side of humanity. Anyway, Yukari's homunculus is her, but made of sand, able to shift her body parts around at will, constantly falling apart into piles of dust and reshaping according to her mood. Which is, by itself, actually a really cool concept. Nakashi theorizes that Yukari is made of sand because she's able to mold herself into whatever shape she feels is necessary to get by in different situations. Sometimes that means conforming to the pressure her strict mother puts on her. Sometimes it's fitting in with her friends at school. The only times Yukari breaks that mold is when she's doing something outside of what's expected of her, like shoplifting or cutting herself or selling her underwear. So... Having observed this, Nakashi decides that the best way to get Yukari to shed her homunculus is to force her to do something extremely far outside her comfort zone. Like, oh, I don't know, give up her virginity. I have to say, although I hope it goes without saying, I was not thrilled by this. It's kind of infuriating to be led to believe this is our hero, to genuinely feel empathy and hope for him only to realize after all of this that he's actually this. What starts out as a sort of psychological confrontation between them turns into a weird, one-sided, non-consensual assault, driven by some heretofore unknown evil in Nakashi's psyche. It's a disorienting, surreal, graphic experience. I'll spare you the details. 
I'll just say that Yukari did try to make him stop, and he wouldn't, so there's no real room for argumentation around his motives or anything like that. It is exactly as dark as it seems. Even when her mother appeared and looked right into the car at them, it didn't end. I suppose, after everything, he has technically exercised her homunculus, but at what cost? Yukari seems weird afterward. She calls a splatter of her own blood on the window beautiful. She smiles dreamily at Nakashi, the man who just forcibly took her virginity as he drives off. Do I even need to say that this scene changed the whole experience for me? From this point forward, I was unable to see Nakashi as anything other than a villain. I won't claim to know what the author was thinking, but whether or not this emotional shift was intentional, it was definitely poignant. This whole time, Nakashi's homunculus had been invisible. Whenever he looked at himself in a mirror, he had just seen his own normal reflection until he started exercising the homunculi of others. After the episode with the Akaza boss, Nakoshi's homunculus gained the arm of the robot suit. After the incident with Yukari, his leg turned to sand. But still, it was as if his homunculus, the I think I'm starting to understand why this story is called a homunculus. Okay, so they are like the new form of this guy Yukari, I think. Okay. He seems to be <laughs> molded by the surrounding season and Yukari also was I think broke and had to do something to make money so him getting his skull pierced is like whatever that's your body you can do whatever you want with it but then we are told like now one time he helped a yakuza boss by uh i guess confronting him about his insecurities then quickly after that he is he gets the opportunity to uh, assault probably a minor all of these actions were uh, within his range of opportunity and considering what kind of person he is it's a little interesting i guess he copies parts of i don't think he uh, intentionally does it i think now this is for coming from someone who has never read homunculus homunculus is a creature that is made through uh, an artificial human right artificial human made through scientific means so is he uh so slowly turning into a, a an abomination something that is a thing that is no longer human perhaps perhaps not but let us continue a monstrous depiction of his own soul had been on display from the very beginning. It's just that it was identical to his outward appearance. He didn't need to appear as some weird monster, because he was, in very concrete terms, already a monster. And it turns out, this was always the case. Before he lost his job, he worked at a foreign bank, gleefully running other companies into the ground and causing thousands of people to lose their livelihoods. He was a womanizer, a narcissist, and a pathological liar. He even sort of lied to me at the very beginning of the manga by leading me to believe that he was someone worth rooting for. Even his physical appearance is a falsehood. Years prior, he had his face completely reconstructed with plastic surgery because he was convinced he was uniquely hideous. After which, he abandoned his pregnant girlfriend because he thought he was now so far out of her league that he was embarrassed to be seen with her. So, we can pretty much accept that Nakashi is, in fact, not the story's hero by this point. In fact, he only gets worse as the story progresses. And, I'll admit, it only got harder and harder to read. Not because it's bad, but again, 
because it is just so dark. There is one more instance of Nakashi helping someone free themselves from their homunculus, which felt like a very welcome return to form. He was too far gone at this point for me as a character, but I had a glimmer of hope that that compelling formula from the story start was about to come back. The homunculus in question belongs to one of the other homeless men in the park and takes the form of an egg, simultaneously a home and a shield for the man inside of it. Once Nakashi frees that man of his homunculus, he feels that he's done his good deed for the day, until later, when he finds that the man, no longer feeling protected within the safety of the shield he'd created for himself and his mind, has taken his own life. This is the pattern with Nakashi's help. He takes it upon himself to fix problems that people aren't asking him to solve, and in some cases, aren't even aware of. Every time he... Man, that whole thing about the eggshell thing is really, like, I don't know how to say this. It is terrifying, because we all kind of... Well, at least the people who are... Uh, let's say fed up with reality love to imagine things and talk about them and express their opinions but in the end we are just what is essentially a shell right and by a shell i'm not talking about those hard ones i'm talking about like the snail ones they don't really give us any uh i guess they don't really give us any protection actually but having that feels like at least uh, that's something that is going to keep me safe that is what i see fiction as basically fiction is something that i admire and aspire to become i guess Okay, I think that's enough do, Marisa. Let's continue the video. He helps someone. They end up worse off. Sure, the Yakuza boss seems like an exception. He did end up leaving the crime life. But he still ends up cutting off his own pinky in the end. And while Yukari wasn't necessarily happy with her life, by no means did she ask to be assaulted in a homeless man's car to fix it. And when it comes to this final case, the man was obviously not in a place to confront his past. When Nakashi forced that confrontation on him, he saw no way to move forward and decided that the only solution was to end it. I can only conclude that Nakashi was never really helping anybody. Not really. If anything, he was just trying to help himself, projecting his own inner conflict onto them fixing their ugly souls, perhaps because he knows that he harbors a monster worse than any of theirs within. All of this reaches a peak when he's reminded of his ex, the one he abandoned while she was pregnant, remember? He becomes obsessed with finding her again, as she was the only person who ever saw him for what he really was, and fixing her, too. There's just one problem with that. He can't even remember her face, which makes it nearly impossible for him to recognize her even when they do eventually cross paths. In this last movement of the story, he spirals into an obsessed stalker, harassing all his ex-lovers just to find this one. When he finally does find her, he tries to help her by performing the same trepanation procedure he received on her. This goes about as well as you'd expect. Instead of giving her a sixth sense, he just ends up lobotomizing her. If that weren't dark enough for you, the last time we see her, she's lying prone and emotionless in a hotel room bed, having just been taken advantage of by a delusional, transfixed Nakashi. The series ends with Nakashi still living out of his car one year later. He's shaved his head and multiple trepanation wounds are visible on his skull. He wears an eye patch, which means that all he ever sees of people are now their homunculi. And now, in the depths of his madness and self-absorption, 
Every homunculus he sees looks exactly like him. <sighs> so? My thoughts on homunculus are complicated. I thought that the homunculi themselves were awesome, the visuals were super unique and interesting, and I had a ton of fun picking apart the crowd shots and imagining what the symbolism could all mean. I was totally on board for a series about a lovable yet sort of pathetic young man helping people process their hidden trauma, but that isn't what I got. As fun as the homunculus concept is, it was way less fun to watch Nakashi devolve into insanity and become more and more of a monster through his actions. And I mean that very literally. Remember, the more homunculi he exercised in his way, the stranger his own homunculus became. By the end, Nakashi's homunculus is an amalgamation of everyone else's trauma. The arm of the Yakuza robot, a leg made of sand, a head encased in an egg. But that's not all. Now, when he tries to see other homunculi, all he sees is the artificial face he gave himself through plastic surgery. He himself is just a collage of other people, surrounded by his own false image. What started off as one relatively normal, likable guy surrounded by monsters gets turned inside out. Unsuspecting people preyed on by a narcissist. And although it turned my metaphorical stomach inside out as well, and I really hated being caught off guard like this, it was actually kind of an incredible inversion. I'm not here to solve this story or tell you exactly what it all means, but it did leave me feeling raw, destabilized, like if someone were to that does sound like me after I read uh, No Longer Human. I was like, oh shit. This, I never thought about someone being this depressed. Someone having this many mental health problems and uh, basically not having any way to explain and ha make other people understand it. I'm so confused. Okay, this series does look fascinating and uh, very much spoiled, but let's move on, I guess. And this uh, tool is pretty cool looking, but it was used to, you know, lobotomize people. To drill a hole in their head, cover up one eye and look at me, what kind of monster would they see? If I were to do it and look at myself, would I see anything at all? I guess that's what therapy is for. You know, there's a strange, almost voyeuristic quality to this story, isn't there? It really freaks me out because, believe it or not, I am uh, sort of chronically worried about being spied on. My circumstances for that may be a bit... Oh, are we talking about NordVPN? Okay, guys, check out NordVPN. Nick, but I don't think I'm alone in that feeling at all. Let's face it, the internet has become a pretty un... But to be fair, a town without streets, it is also a manga by Junjito. That does tell a great story about paranoia. Uh... And the consequences of lacking, um, what, privacy, yes. A comfortable environment. We all pretty much know there's more information about us out there than we'd probably like. As a machine of un... I'm not sure why I'm uh, c completely watching this video. But I am, so whatever. Known origin with enough obvious sentience to host a YouTube channel that makes me particularly uncomfortable. One wrong move and I end up in a dark hangar somewhere disassembled for research purposes. <sighs> for this, among many other reasons, I've been careful to spend as much time offline as possible. But that might not actually be necessary for me anymore. 